Uh, thank you for being here, everyone, and thank you, Abhital uh, for gracing us with your presence and your brilliance and for surrounding and embracing this exhibition with your words and essay. Thank you to Jack Rasmussen for the invitation of this exhibition, Haunted Koreas, and the American University Museum team for mounting the show and for hosting today's gallery talk. My name is Mina Chan. In Korean, whoops, that moved right over. <laughs> Again, my name is Mina Chan. In Korean, my birth name, Chun Min Jong, was given to me by an auspicious fortune teller based on Korean Bohang astrology. It comes from Chinese characters meaning a thousand times more righteous than the righteous stone. I'm Korean American, Korean Korean, Korean Jewish, with the Hebrew name Zipporah Bat Abraham. I'm a mother, a daughter, a sister, and occasionally I tend and hope to believe that the feminist project is never over. As an artist, scholar, educator, and administrator, as well as a student and an implant in America, I see the world through a complex lens that responds to a variety of issues related to social justice across lands and borders. From Baltimore, New York, to Seoul, South and North Korea, between the Koreas and neighboring countries, Japan and China, Northeast and Southeast Asia, to Eastern world and Western worlds divided, the commonality to overcome struggles exists persistently and relentlessly by the people over there and over here. This is a story of one person, presumably female, surrounded by many of those who love me. That includes everyone here today. My country is split into North and South Korea. The splintering forces extend themselves in other ways, progressive and conservative politics, severe gender division servicing a distinctive Confucius Korean patriarchy protested by every Korean woman I know, the religious hierarchy among Christianity and Buddhism and shamanism, and contradictions between the Western neoliberal lifestyle versus Korean expressions of humility and modesty. The division between the Koreas is a relic of the Cold War, layered by the traumatic history of Japanese colonization, the Korean War, and the aftermath, that reinforces the complexities and dualities, paradoxes, paradoxes in its social fabric. Excuse me. It is what it is. It is what it is not to be or imagine oneself as Korean. My generation X is stuck between the old and new. This is very strange. Many of us living between countries, myself Korean yet American, Western and Eastern, with colliding values I piece together as forced hybridity and transnational identity. Between generations, we have become barriers of protest skills and urgencies. Fine. Tracing Korea's modern pro-democracy protests, they existed since the post-Choson dynasty under Japanese colonial rule as marches. The simultaneous embrace of modernization and westernization promoted human rights and ideas of independence, which fermented the seeds to help liberate Korea from Imperial Japan. Still, the desire for human liberation and rights continues today with inter-Korean peace efforts from both North and South Korea creating elasticity beyond the contours of its own nation state. Korea has been historically flooded with protests. As people rise, Shimin, citizens, Minjung, the people's movement, cascading as markers of a performing nation that seeks a catalyst for change at each turn. From Yu Guan Sun, March 1st, 1919, independent movement from Japanese colonization, and anti military government Hwangju uprise in the 80s. and Im Suk Young's legendary peace walk through the DMZ in 1989. To the 2016 candlelight democracy protests, 
and the plethora of uprisings that continue to surge. The 2018 Me Too of Korea, the weekly Wednesday Comfort Woman protest in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul, the anti-Japanese 2019 boycott of Japan, and the anti-U.S. free trade agreement with the rise of the 99% against American imperialism and military presence. Other things such as Korea's pride parades. Out of these forms of protest, many Korean women, LGBTQIA+, laborers, students, and intellectuals have taken sides to rise. Protests and movements are called undong in Korean, and it means to exercise. Unfortunately, as for the possibility of a participatory government in Korea has been suppressed by the government for so long, to the extent of just bracketing injustices of every kind with a catch-all phrase of, it is the Korean way. The existence of counter-organization persists with brute forces coming from both sides. How I fit into the picture. A Korean-Korean living, sometimes in New York, and in Baltimore most of the time. I work at Micah and I've been in this singular community for 25 years, half my life. And while Korea never left my mind or abandoned my spirit, and I visit home frequently enough, peace work is not entirely about one place or another. Activism exists as a creative force in the streets, the cities, and centers, and parks all over the world, in the classroom and education setting, in an art exhibition, and in galleries and museums. The current exhibition, Haunted Korea, is here as a curated global activism project, as an exhibition using educational space as a platform for exchange and dialogue and awareness, building efforts in a university museum. At this time, art and life come together for me, and protest is recognized in art, as an art practice. Art activism for social justice work is a crucial cultural expression of our time that exists here in Okabear. Indeed, I'm not the only Asian in America to say black lives matter always and thank you for stopping Asian hate as all these things relate. Even in America, I've not yet met a contemporary artist who attends rallies, but I've met many who protest. Parades, peace walks, and protests aligns with the artistic practice declaring the individual and collective performativity as modes of subverting norms, hegemonies, governing powers, and established law. The marginalized and outcast, those who remain in the periphery, are layered by the common threads related to justice and peace, of peace works. As an artist working with the times may use all the language and tools of the arts, but we could also make work with a message and directives imparted by our culture of awareness. My artistic medium is my conscience. I share, therefore I am. Coming from this protest culture and backdrop, I, Nina Chun, who also works, performs, practices art as and with Kim Il Sun, her North Korean art persona and counterpart, exhibit art for Korean unification while protesting peace. The work, works were first exhibited at the Ethan Cohen Gallery in New York, a solo show, Dreaming Unification Protest Peace in 2020 and 21 at the height of the pandemic and before vaccination rollouts. We brave to raise the flags, the Korean unification flags that allowed for a second extended life at the Korea Society in New York. The unification flags are figures and they are raised high and in line like a procession of a The solo exhibition at the Korea Society ran concurrently with the inaugural Asia Society Triennale 2020-2021 exhibition at the Asia Society Museum in New York. The works in these two sites related directly to each other and pointed to the interconnected artistic investigation into the complex ties, histories, and conundrums between the two Koreas and the biases many non-Koreans have about these issues. Living with the daily terror of Russian invasion of Ukraine and the global impact, anxieties rise and that anything can happen next. In North Korea, continued spectacles arise with ongoing threats. April 15, 2022, the 110th anniversary of the birth of Kim Il-sung was the day of the sun and also marked Kim Jong-un's 10 years in power. While military parades are one thing, there is an escalation of missile testing. 
China remains an ally with a blind eye to the activities of North Korea's acceleration of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. With the former South Korean president Moon Jae-in's drowns hopes for reconciliation efforts with North Korea, who knows where we stand with the new president, Yoon suk yeol As a leader of the conservative people power, he capitalizes on anti-feminist rhetoric to win his campaign and has set a tone for a grim future against democracy from the outset. In 2020, we witnessed the Inter-Korean Liaison Office building a Kaesong blown up due to the parachuting of anti-North Korean propaganda leaflets into the North from the South. Today, there's nevertheless North Korean citizens' resistance and consumption of foreign information that also have tightened governmental surveillance. Moreover, the violent blow-up of the inter-Korean space for peace talks coincided with the 75th anniversary of the Workers' Party's military celebration, parading these new ICB, ICBMs. In South Korea, still economically robust and considered America's finest ally in the model of pro democratic country in Asia, the consumption culture continues with the riches and the lands. K-Wave films and K-pop thrive on market, marking South Korea as a producer of new cultural elites for the global market. Frankly, the ongoing struggles for reconciliation between a meat first capitalist state of South Korea, now with a heightened conservatism and lifting its defense policies may radically change the forecast of the exchanges between the two countries. Divided Korea is a nuclear Korea. While we used to think that the Korean War was frozen in time, peace talks about reconciliation remain in question as ideological freedom and democracy from the South can't outweigh the socialist sovereignty of the North with a nuclear deterrent. And North Korea has withheld through time that they still exist with all kinds of international sanctions. What is Korean unification? Reunification like United Germany? Korean reunification may be opening of the DMZ and extended tourism, shared economy, labor, shared natural resources. Still, reconciliation between two systems without one giving in or being forced at the hands of the other seems unlikely. Furthermore, what would be the aftermath of reunification? Can a one-state, two-system solution be different from those we have seen? China and Hong Kong have increased struggles from within and have further separated from global accountability or Israel and Palestine. When will their war end? Being frozen in time is a neutralizer, political propaganda, or complacency and amnesia because the Korean Peninsula was always and has been on fire, remaining a war zone. Moreover, the past years of secret underground human rights activism for and within North Korea are far more dangerous today. At the same time, North Korean internal economy relies on the black market and the North Korean citizens are coming to greater awareness of the world outside their urban kingdom. As a result, we face a new precarious and unpredictable state of questioning who will lead and carry out Korean unification. The wave may come stronger from the North Koreans. Indeed, North Korean defectors in South Korea are connectors and leaders of the future. They are already doing the work of reconciliation. They embody Korean and are the unifiers. The arc of my work is done in response. The artistic practice has been about what is possible to transmit and work between the Koreas for sharing, streaming, and communicating for Korean unification and global peace. As I yearn for my country, land, people, and family, the work is about communication between self and other. It is about crossing borders and blurring the boundaries to cross the line. It is about sharing choco pies, with the world, sharing video art history lessons with North Koreans, receiving paintings from them, and sneaking around painting unification faith, flags in secret, in dreams, in dream worlds, and in the world of imagination and the stream of collective unconsciousness, we can work the future spilled out into fragments of our social reality. One of the pre-COVID headlines in North Korea was the buzz of Yo Yo Ma performing at the heavily fortified DMZ on September 9th. Calling for peace, 
and the building of bridges across cultures. But unfortunately, the short-term effect of music, entertainment, and, or athletic competition to bridge peace on warfare feels unsatisfactory, relying on fabricated catharsis that cannot compensate for 70 years of separation between Korean families. The unification flag, waved by the joint North and South Korean athletic teams during the 2018 Pyeongchang Olympics, were only a momentary bliss for our Koreas. And I think back at the moment when I got to ride a bus right through the DMZ from South to North Korea in 2004, visiting Kim Jong Sun. Back then, I could have never imagined the future when Trump gets to jump over the other side, like <coughs> roping or hopscotching. Nor did I see a future where a North Korean soldier ran across the DMZ for his life and was shot. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> I thought this was your reference, Kathy. <laughs> anyway, was shot that he woke up from his surgeries from in South Korea wanting to eat a chocolate pie. So I've become a fan of peace and decided that we must protest for peace by walking, dreaming, eating, sharing. I walk for peace in global peace shoes, and so do my friends around the world. Since one foot cannot move without the other, the left cannot move without the right. We eat choco pie together. As one of my main mediums for global activism, the food for art and healing, South Korea manufactured chocolate marshmallow cookie cake worth three bowls of rice in North Korea, which remains a strong currency in the black market and a favorite smuggled good there. With thousands of uh, helium blooms, which Chocopai sent over the DMZ and circulated within North Korean black market for years, today's Chocopai is undoubtedly a cultural symbol of love and peace within the I dedicated 100,000 choco pies to North Korean defectors in South Korea. They were consumed by art lovers and global peace lovers alike during the 2018 Busan Biennale at the Busan Contemporary Art Museum, sponsored by the choco pie manufacturer of South Korea, Odeon, even the South Korean President Moon Jae-in and First Lady Kim Jong-suk came to eat choco pie together before they jutted off to for the Asia Society Ternale in New York, titled We Do Not Dream Alone, a physical installation event that was supposed to happen at the Lincoln Center had to go virtual during the pandemic. To respond to our socially distanced time with the coronavirus, eTruplePyTogether.com was created as a digital social practice initiative. This website allowed people to stay connected by sending virtual choco pies to loved ones with a custom message. You could click on the map of the Korea and select artistically designed packages with a the theme of love, peace, share, eat, and unite, referencing things we need right now, whether we are in divided Korea or in the United States of America. And each participation in sharing the pies automatically raise funds for the Korean Americans affected by the coronavirus through the Korean American Community Foundation COVID-19 Action Fund. Dreaming Korean unification, eating choco pies, walking for peace, and information media penetration into North Korea are all artistic works to cross over the borders and boundaries to cross over the DMZ that physically separates North and South Koreans. As global activism art, my work is intended to infiltrate the Korean psyche by calling on peace, streaming for Korean unification. I've been sending contemporary video art history lessons into North Korea through USB drives, SD cards, and media carriers since 2017 with the help of North Korean defector activists in South Korea and intermediaries who frequently cross many border lines between Korea, China, and Russia. I do this with love and a message to North Koreans, I love you and the world loves you. The videos were created with North Koreans in mind with a specific visual and popular media language like into children's TV shows for accessibility and security reasons. 
In them, Professor Kim Il-sun purposefully gives prescribed global art history lessons against the backdrop of North Korean receivers who are primarily familiar with state-sanctioned propaganda art of North Korea. My sources and inspiration for this work comes from existing scholarships related to North Korea's hidden revolution. The video series includes art history lessons on Marcel Duchamp, Andy Warhol, Ai Weiwei, Mark Rapper, Nam Jun Pai, Shiran Nishad, Kim Soo Ja, and many others, and focuses on topical themes of modern and contemporary art, such as art, life, food, reproduction, feminism, social justice, and the environment. The real message, however, is about human rights to education. From the other histories of secluded countries, hermit kingdoms, totalitarian societies, that too have opened up from Arab Spring to the foreseeable Pyongyang Spring, it is possible to rise up from within with media in one hand and freedom in the other. The extended work I now call asynchronous communication with North Korean citizens exemplified by the Last Supper was painted by anonymous North Korean painters who also risked their lives painting it. It was presented and is presented here along with the videos and the new tell players. Together for the Alper Initiative at the American University Museum, you see more unification flag paintings, videos, and paintings from North Korea, and it features the asynchronous communication coming from both sides of the peninsula. The Last Supper was sent to me to funnel support for human rights in North Korea. The painting is key to understanding another level of ongoing exchanges between Korea, uh, both North and South, and what is considered the premium of Western art history by North Koreans. It's over there at the back, if you have a chance to see it. The diptych painting of Korean unification flags and the Korean word Udi down the center includes the Korean Han and pro-democracy sentiments. Many Korean uh, contemporary artists, workers of social justice and keepers of peace like myself, belong to a vast nexus of Korean artists working with post min jong misu people's democracy art. It's a lineage that is responding to the fraught relations between North and South Korea and its relationship to the United States of America. The AKA Kim Il-sun shift with W. K. Kim Il-sun is pertinent to understanding the basis of reading my, her, their, our work because my art practice, both as Chun and Kim, and the many of us, parallels the split of the Koreas and the splintering effect of a fragmented nation. The Korean unification flag painting series hits a different chord from past Kim Il-sun's dream painting styles, from social, socialist realism, pop art, to abstract expressionism, dip and drip abstraction. This has brought to light with the greatest sense of urgency in an aesthetic arrest of street graffitis and salon tagging, forms of protest art. The works come together in this site as a solo show, Mina Chan with Kim Min Soon, Monte Korea's. It is brought into a full circle, closing up a chapter and spotlight a decade's worth of artistic practice with a supportive and guiding exhibition text, The History of a Paradoxical Incorporation by Critical Theorist Avital Ronell, my teacher, my mentor, friend, and ally. I've asked her to help bridge me to the next chapter and a little closer to Korean unification, which she then responds with the question, so Mina, which one is it, dreaming or protesting? Here's my response. Dear Sabitel, here's my passive note to you as you stand by my side you are here, but I am rather in your words than by your side. Take a moment to reflect. I wanted to respond to each word on the page that you inscribed for me, always and only. A couple of things about my role as an artist. The role is its own self-contradicting practice and performance where the performativity is beyond myself. 
I work as an agent and a deliverer of messaging, albeit sometimes saying the wrong thing, the right thing, not a thing. It seems to fire away and misfire its place, but it is in the performativity of a living artist and within the paradoxical incorporation that may possibly and honestly state a word or two of activity that is reflective of a time lived. The title you gifted me, Haunted Koreas and the History of Paradoxical Incorporation, opens me up as well as my art. There is no such thing as a resolve in this narrative of paradoxical incorporation of art making with Haunted Koreas. Thank you for teaching me that. I am bound to a world history that makes me the passive Mina, as you kindly put it, but performs my duties in a spectrum of a resolute Mina. For the performance itself and performance theory is the only result proposed here. Performance that encompasses the impossibility of reality, social realities, and its extended inclusion of the imaginary and fantasy and the dreaming. As you bracketed for me that my work acknowledges performing Haunted Korea is living the inhibitive encroachments that haunt relations. I am haunted by my very being. Let's take a look at the recent paradoxical history of haunted Koreas, the Korea, North Korea. Frustrated and isolated, North Korea is conducting more missile tests than ever in New York Times October 9th. South Korea, Itaewon. Haunted night, Halloween celebration, Americanized streets, they all come out unmasked, untamed. Who gets stampede, who gets killed? Who's, which lives are lost, October 29th? Who am I? Deanship, service, passive Nina, artist, activation, resolute Nina, mother, planner, passive Nina, friend, interactive Nina, growing Nina. This is where I need to be, how to be a friend, how to survive as an artist. Abitel gave me friendship of a lifetime so that I may continue to work unashamed without apology as an artist. The exhibition essay framed my show in Haunted Koreas in a way that there's no turning back with philosophy that guides the path for premising justice work and peace work that circles back to who owns the narrative, who has the right to make peace. Human rights seems to be a trick question after all. My narrative seems to be a confluence of many her stories over time through generations and withholding a future that I cannot script. I am beholden to a paradoxical situation before and after my time. The more I cannot, the greater my determination. The tension is unbearable. The artistic release is liberating, yet it remains in the world of the fictive as there's no reality that can serve the justice work proposed by art but a score for future thought that may or may not be performed. Dear Abitel again, missiles, goodbye. Shoot water, not missiles. Shoot kisses, not missiles. You ask Omina, so which one is it, dreaming or protesting? It is a paradoxical incorporation without resolve. Truly me not.
just sticking in the air without resolve, as you said. Thank you for honoring us with the missives and missiles that you send off and the questions that you bring to bear also about the uh, behaviors and grammars and uh, demands placed upon the artist. What is an artist's duty or you know, when you think of Immanuel Kant, who wrote the third critique in which he tried to, um, and did very impressively and with great determination, he explained um, what we need from aesthetics and aesthetic form, and he kind of created a wildlife sanctuary for art, which meant that art should not uh, have to bow to any lordship or produce something like social realism that has certain propagandistic uh, aims and claims, but that art should have this wildlife sanctuary where the artist can, can just go wild and release herself from any kind of obedience or obeisance to a, a, what he called a begriff, which is a concept. In German begriff also means you grasp something. As we say in English, I don't grasp this. So let go of the grasp, chill out, and do your art, which in itself does or doesn't shoot blanks according to Kant. Um, by shooting blanks, he, he speaks to the political um, honchos, those who are in charge. And he says, look, you, you guys are going to have to decide. Either we're harmless, we artists, and we just shoot blanks. So leave us alone. Or our work is so endangering and threatening and politically um, crucial in the sense of, of always threatening a kind of upheaval. It's a, an essential protest. Then let us be re-empowered. You have to decide either we're powerless or powerful. And it's difficult to, to make the claims, yet there's so much censorship, so much difficulty and controversy, and also um, um, sacrificial economies that go into making art, to standing up, but also knowing you don't have the power to do much, or you're not listened to in essential ways. So this kind of, let's say, undecidable um, situation in which you find yourself, and that's why maybe this paradigm of are you dreaming, are you protesting, are you pushing back, are you completely uh, impuissant or, or um, impotent in some ways, these kinds of questions, you the minas, as I said, because I see mina split and incorporating a split Korea. I come from many split lands and split off parts and difficult conflictual zones. And I was trying to think of um, the marvelous work I've gotten to do with Mina, who wrote a splendid uh, PhD dissertation. So I perplexed by her, I'm enchanted, I'm a little scared, I, I see different parts um, kind of signaling or muffling signals, and I try to understand to what extent, or let's say my assignment for, for, for this wonderful venture, and I got, I've got to say it's so impressive and beautiful here, and thanks for coming out on a weekend. Um, so I was trying to think to what extent was Mina herself or themselves, because there are many Minas hosted by this signatory and this of this work. 
To what extent was she herself haunted? What does it mean to be haunted? What's the relation to ghosts? And in our cultures, and certainly in Korea, is very much happening in this regard with, in terms of shared um, zombie cults and um, all sorts of undead um, apparitions and disappearances and, and tragic, most recently tragic stampedes and so on and so forth. All of which seem like accidents and also don't seem like accidents. Something has been inscribed into Korea that keeps us on edge and um, makes you want to think psychoanalytically in terms of something like Freud's death drive, what's going on there, what is the schism, what is the break-off point, what is the, um, the kind of uh, mapping of difference, alterity, meaning what kind of otherness is embedded in a purported sameness. They're, they're still Korea, or are they not? Are these different entities that have a pretend viability in terms of being of the same group or or species. I mean, a lot of questions that come up in your work, but one thing that I wanted to pursue in a highly philosophical catalog essay was not only the explicit splitting that uh, Mina and Kim indulge and propose to us, but what does it mean to incorporate one's country or national identity at the same time as shredding it, shaking it off, disidentifying with the very country that you might want to um, somehow get your ID from. In this, re this is very hard. Um, in this regard, I was always guided by Nietzsche in my thinking about what you or, uh, predicament is, which is to say that the great, I hope you feel better, um, that the great philosopher um, Nietzsche systematically, he didn't do anything systematic, but in this case he disidentified with the very object that called for identification. So he, he dumped his German identity, dropped out of school, even though he was a great teacher of philology and, and so on. He broke essential relations, and so he developed, despite himself, an ethics of breakup, of disidentification, of difference. Like, I am different from the very Koreas that I embody and inscribe in certain ways. So I wanted to, um, track the different, let's say, philosophical split-off parts of Mina. There's a very uh, traditional part that she inscribes, a very maternal part, a very defiant, a very compliant. So these are contradictory and paradoxical um, tags that she wears with a kind of um, important um, relation to the abyss of our relation to our countries, whether they are birth countries or other kinds of countries. So part of her um, vocabulary is, it has to do with um, distributing contraband or choco pies. So it's about um, the sharing of sweetness which, as someone who has uh, worked very hard with psychoanalysis, made me feel ironically inclined toward the work because Freud reminds us, for example, that when you say that someone is sweet or something is sweet, that comes from our cannibalistic past. 
like what people say to children, some of whom develop serious symptoms, you are so sweet I could eat you up. I don't know if you grew up with um, the threat of being eaten up because you're so cute, yum. So that, however, that might seem a little okay, but there's something very profound about sharing food or turning um, our identifications with objects or entities or national entities and identities, converting them into food substances, and which is all part of a philosophical tradition of assimilating, like when you say, I'm digesting an idea, that's part of the digestive tract or expelling or expulsing certain things. Nietzsche was a great um, expectorator, which means he spit out so much. He kept on saying he was throwing up, which also meant he was pregnant, but that's another issue in his way of um, presenting his philosophical splits, uh, as when you said, presumably, you are seen as a woman. Um, the gender tag is, is not very um, stable. As other kinds of um, identities that we'd like to be able to find reliable. Now I'm just going to switch very quickly and we really want to engage you, but um, one of the paradoxical, well, if I'm talking about what you eat, um, no matter how sweet it is, it's part of um, a kind of introjection. How do you invite the other or otherness to, how do you internalize it? And when I wrote about the um, paradox of incorporation, the paradoxality there is that you do and don't incorporate. You're like guarding a condemned site that you can't keep down. It makes you want to throw up or somehow um, operate like a cemetery guard, take care of this space, speak to a haunted entity. Now what do ghosts do? What, what is haunted? How do the undead behave? Well, certainly since Hamlet and the way Derrida um, reflected on this, he was my teacher, so you're in a lineage um, here. Um, ghosts ask for justice or repair. They're dissatisfied, they show up, they want justice done. But at least they want a response. You have to respond to a ghost, you can't just ignore and so on. So I was wondering to what degree, on many levels, you are not only haunted, but um, besieged by what I, I call paradoxical incorporation, which meant you didn't introject. You are and are not Korean. You are, and some of your family is, is from North Korea, so where does that, um, what zone of being does that occupy? Not in a conscious or even unconscious way, but as something that signals according to different kinds of protocols that I won't disturb you with. I just wanted to say that we're involved as with many, many minorities, many um, who come from troubled backgrounds and countries. We all come from troubled countries, by the way, with horrible histories. And I'll explain that as a, as a finishing touch here. But um, we're involved and we take up the banners as, as heavy as they are, in a politics of memory, inheritance, and generations. Like, what, what do we inherit, and what is our debt to the past, even if it fails to show up, or it might come as a ghost and spook you, or you yourself might be carrying what they call a crypt of the other, so that you're decrypting, you're, you're listening for and attuned to someone else's loss. It's not even your own loss, it could be your grandparents, 
could be your parents. How do you um, maneuver with that? So I was thinking in terms of your project and your, your protest and your um, very complicated uh, maneuvers, I was thinking of intergenerational trauma, what has been transmitted to you as a haunting force. Now, there's one problem with history that is also contradictory and paradoxical is, and one problem that we all grapple with is that if history is the history of trauma, that's what gets written about, reported, chronicled, so it's traumatic. Do we have the access code or passwords to it? Because trauma means you're zapped, you're blank, your, uh, your memory fails you, you barely can retrieve little fragments of hallucinatory um, indicators. So what we understand as history is itself an impossibility to the extent that history is traumatically um, wrecked, and this is what we're all fighting over, history, what is history, how can it not, I mean, do we even have a handle on it, and how dare you, um, in terms of plantations, and slavery, and all sorts of troubled zones that you opened up to when you say that there is an essential um, collegiality and need to be engaged in Black Lives Matter, matter, and it matters. And how does it matter, and how does it also um, recede from one's grasp? I'm sorry for being so, um, I have a lot to say, and I prepared maybe um, too philosophical um, consideration. I just wanted to um, maybe um, say that what your project may evoke in all of us is the question of how to locate where we can um, agitate or feel deflated and defeated when historical language and inscription and art are um, necessarily at a remove. You know, we, we're at once attending to it, and yet what we get are, are fragments. Um, there's a lot of silence involved. The grandparents and parents of trauma tend not to want to uh, talk about it. So there's other transmission systems. You get, you get your um, pings and um, pangs from other unaccounted for sources that we try to translate and, and um, hold in some ways that are honoring. But to be honor, truly honoring, you can't assume that you've understood. And I see your work in its, um, I can't claim having a sense of its totality because there's always things that escape even my high tech shit detectors, you know. Um, there's not, I don't catch everything, but nonetheless I have been very attentive to and proud of, if I may say so, of the way you have um, dealt with um, a near impossibility and a call that you put out that is quivering, that isn't even sure of itself, that has many different tonalities, different possibilities, and also understands its own impossibility. My teacher, our teacher Derrida said, if it weren't impossible, we wouldn't be interested in doing the work. So. Um, we're dealing with the impossible, and it's it's not always pretty, it's not always easy, and it's not always uh, something that will
get approval. So um, I don't know if this can inspire some questioning and, and conversation. And I certainly would be happy to elaborate on one of my most intelligible speeches ever. <laughs> so thank you. to a country that is possibly broken, split off, um, is how it um, manages to um, be accommodated and welcomed and pushed against. So there are many types of, as you said yourself, ghost spirits, the soul of the country, soul, soul. Um, and what kind of, um, let's say, phantom and fantasies attend not only a country, but its painful history that can and can't be told. You know, there's an excess of telling about Korea. We have an excess, but there's also a lack of um, understanding or thinking what it means to um, be somehow tethered to something that is not working. Yes. I was the first one in my family to be born here. My, my parents came from South Korea in 1967. And, um, I was born and raised in New York and was uh, very much brought up to assimilate to the American culture. Um, my parents didn't push speaking Korean in the household for the youngest siblings um, and I mean the youngest children, which I was one of them. Um, and so I had, I grew up in this dichotomy where I was hearing Korean, but I didn't really, I didn't speak it because my parents did not want me to um, uh, <laughs> I'm not really sure what they wanted but they uh, just wanted me to be American and um, I think what happened was that I as I got older that's exactly what I felt a disconnection to my culture and where do I come from? And not even having the courage to ask my parents to talk about their history because they came from a painful history. They were Korean, the Korean War and World War II when they were young. They saw a lot of war and hardship and I 
I can't even talk about it to them and, and ask what happened because, as you were saying, there's a lot of untold pain that they don't want to talk about, and I don't want to bring it up for them because they, they stop talking about it. It's a strange, I'm sorry, for you, but I'm inspired by what you're saying. There's a strange um, call for you to hold that um, inaccessibility and somehow protect the zone of. Um, trauma that won't tell and in not telling is telling you. So that's why I brought up the question of our debt to this um, inaccessible silence, a history of pain that is muted and yet bleeding and pumping everywhere. Everyone is lacerated by these stories. So that, this is a kind of different uh, level and logic of history, because we are bearers of histories that haven't been transmitted. And in a sense, Mina's work is uh, tapping the crypt um, of, of, of martyrs that connects, disconnects, connects her to martyrs, to protest movements, and she's hounded and haunted by this non-presence that is pressing on her without, um, without um, letting up. So there's a constant pressure that she's also, in order to be all these other things, like she's a mom and so on, and a dean, and she has to shake it off, and then it comes for her at certain we don't even know when or what. That's why I wanted to focus a little bit on what we eat, what we keep down, what we throw up. Uh, how do we, do you eat Korean food? Do you eat with um, chopsticks? Do you uh, prefer forks and knives and that violence of Western appropriation? Why do Americans, okay, I have a crazy theory. I'm educated, well, diseducated as a Germanist. So I've studied a lot of German philosophy and poetry and music, but I've always been curious about why Americans love hamburgers and frankfurters. And so it's like we chow down on our enemies from World War II, you know? That this is the way you appropriate the other and take them in and hold them down because you there's all sorts of strange conversions and determinations like when what what is it that one desires and the first point of desires entry is also what kind of meals do you serve do you prepare what disgusts you what's a history of disgust that means you won't swallow your ancestors, or you are each time communing with the non-present other who is inhabiting you. We host lots of phantoms. Sometimes it's not even your own desire that's remote. You're being remote controlled, as in Flaubert. Madame Bovary didn't desire her husband, but she was kind of temping for someone else who wanted this or that. So she was hosting, um, this is a crazy sidebar, the desire of her dead brother. So it's not even clear that you're working for yourself, but you may be the host body and soma, psyche, uh, of a missing other. So that maybe your grandmother couldn't have this or that, and suddenly you, who are pumped and remote controlled by a, a frustrated desire, you want this or that. And it's not, and you say to yourself, I don't even want this. Whom am I working for? And bringing this in, this, this. So even the question of desire and choice at the most basic primal level, like what do you choose to eat? Which is taking in a foreign alien object and and um, making it your own. Like, so what becomes your own? But is it always a, dis, a, a history of dispossession? Like, I'm not Korean, I'm not American, I'm both and neither. 
And that split in, in Mina's work is actually, I mean, this sounds a little um, cliche, but it's actually liberating to live in the impossible zones of conflictual histories that can't even be told. Like, there is a responsibility, you are responding, but you're not sure what you're being asked to do. Does that make a little tiny bit of sense? I'd like to say something. Um, so two things. I have a very dear old friend who, as a young child, escaped from North Korea with several siblings and parents. And she speaks about walking hours and hours and nothing to eat and so forth. And I've questioned her several times on what her recollections are. Um, but that's one thing. And the second thing is that as older people now, and probably your uh, parents, if they're still alive, and, um, is to get them to relate some of these things because they may want to. Be careful. I don't know. But some I, people release the stories and they check out. They can't deal. So, yeah, I'd love to respond to a couple of things. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot, but. I was thinking about receiving information from, uh, you know, past generations about past traumas. You know, it's it's you know you're you're very close and you have this kind of uh, primary relationship with your um, you know parents, your your mother, and you're hearing the stories. There's something about uh, what I'm learning today and mostly this weekend is the terrible burden of receiving such information, you know, because um, here I am providing information, you know, providing information to North Korea, it's foreign media. I'm providing information by sharing my daily experience, my personal life, and I'm going on and on. Um, but it did occur to me most recently about the way in which someone might receive it and how uh, the experience of receiving information is also, you know, it carries that history of um, trauma. So there was a time when I used to think, you know, imperialism, any, anything where you believe that you can uh, help program, you know, further develop was inherently, um, you know, a, a colonial act, a colonial, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, I mean, I, I feel like I'm saying narcissistic, but it's a very selfhood. It's a, you know, like um, creating oneself extended. And so I did fear in passing information to North Koreans, you know, um, but I never really, you know, there is a whole kind of, uh, modality of activism that is being spelled out and the language of how to do it and what's right and how to measure impact that now I'm starting to question like I'm bearing this traumatic history uh, through um, what I've received and now I'm wondering well why the hell did I receive these fragmented memories that has harmed me and haunted me my whole life and then it's echoed by the industry of what is created as Korea. And I'm also helping that go into North Korea without, um, yeah, I, I'm conscious of it, but like shooting blanks, am I supposed to feel empowered by that sharing or um, passing on? You know, I, I'm coming to a moment of reflection, like this has been really um, the gift where I'm starting to question that this is a very important artistic process where you have to reflect and kind of assess, you know, what is it that I'm doing and am I truly um, getting to where I want it to be or feel that I need to be as an artist and so forth. And the shooting blanks is the way you describe, is it, uh, effective? Is it aimless? Is it, you know, um, you can't yeah, control you can't control it. Give an example. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm thinking about that impossibility. Does shooting blanks mean, as in, 
sending information to Korea and having all this exchange for good, you, you know. Um, is that um, by doing these things, am I liberated because I have permission to be shooting blind, or does it make me more responsible to be always moving ahead to try and find the target? You know, so it, I mean, that's what is. I also think this is a bizarre thing to claim nowadays, but that even the history of colonialism should be dis desimplified. For example, my friend Mantia Diawara, who's an African um, filmmaker, we met in Berlin. We were each doing our performances, and uh, we went met. He was in one museum. I was across the street, and then we came to the beer garden, and it was the night of uh, big, big playoffs in soccer, of the Mexicans versus the French. And I said, let's go cheer for the Mexicans. And he said, oh no, please don't, let's, let's cheer for the French. I go, Montia, I thought you were colonized by these people. And he goes, Avi, do not underestimate the power of colonization. And I go, you mean you will not go with me to, to the Mexican <laughs> side? He said, I can't. Please, let's go to the French side. So um, I said, well, I'm sad because it's nothing compared to what I would feel if I had to <laughs> betray my colonizers. So I learned something. Of course, he's, you know, what's the big A in Lacan, the autre, the other? who has squatted in you, who has taken over, even if you think consciously, they can go to hell, or I've, I've done, I'm done with that, I'm a free being. But that moment, which was precisely innocuous, harmless, and meaningless, like, for goodness sake, of all the scale and damages of, of conflict, a soccer game, freaked us out reciprocally. And he said, I will never talk to you again if you schlep me to, <laughs> you know, the Mexican side. And I said, OK. Because I saw that he actually was suddenly um, gripped by some sort of spectral imperative that his bosses, the French, were still the ones he's going to cheer on. I don't know how that complication in our itineraries serve you or not. But I don't think we really even control, you know, when you shoot blanks, all you know, you might know that you hit some innocent bystander. I don't know why I did that, because no one's innocent. I don't know why I did Some innocent bystander. Um, you don't know, you don't control the itinerary. You don't know where this will arrive, what, who gets hurt or hit or somehow um, sanctified or proved in an existential way by your work or by the fact that you're working. It may not even mean anything. Just the fact that you are working is already uh, rousing.